Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this open Q&A. We already have so many great questions in, and I'm excited to take your questions as we go through this call. So feel free to put them in the chat here. And we're going to kick off with a question from Deborah. And Deborah said, we have two horses who throw their heads to take the reins. Both are bred to pull carriages and carts, Percheron Quarter Horse Cross, and a Halflinger Welsh. They're both trained otherwise. Halflinger has check reins, um, but still does it consistently. So uh, I'm sure many of you can relate to the annoying or uncomfortable experience of riding a horse who's constantly tossing their head. And anytime that I have a behavior like this from a horse, the first thing that I want to look at is, could there be a physical cause? So it's always worth saying, and it's always worth it's always worth checking. So some of the first things that can cause head shaking from a physical sense is, does the horse have mouth or dental issues? Or does the horse have issues, whether it be injury or whether it be tightness at their pole area? So where the skull is connecting to the neck. Sometimes they can have tightness other places in their body, and this head tossing is a way of expressing that um, that tightness, that tension, or that discomfort. So that's the first thing to look at. And then if it, if it does not appear to have a direct physical cause and it's behavioral, first of all, the two are always linked because we can never say that something's just behavior and not physical because so much of why behaviors are expressed are because of the way that the horse is feeling. So if the horse is feeling a certain way, then they're going to have a behavior. So when we're training, we're giving more clarity to what we want the horse to do. We're providing more motivation for the things that we want the horse to do. And in some cases, making it less motivating, less comfortable for the horse to do the things that we don't. But all of that is, it's changing the behavioral, but it's changing the way that the horse feels. And when they change the way they feel, they're going to change the way that they carry their body. If you see an anxious horse that's got his head up um, and has maybe a tight back and then is moving with more quick, jerky kind of movements, then you, you already know what I mean if we compare this horse with one that's calm and then is moving with a relaxed back and reaching forward with his neck, etc. So I always think about changing anything with our horses because what we're doing with them is so physical. We're riding on them. We're moving with them. We have to think of it from both the, the behavioral, the mental piece, if you will, and also the physical and how are they feeling. So back to some really practical for what to do with these horses that are shaking their heads. Um, it, check also if their bits fit well. So we're, we're kind of taking all the obvious potential problems and, and physical things out of the way. And then we want to look at, can we change the response that these horses have to the bit pressure? So usually it's either when pressure is taken, and that can sometimes be even unconsciously by the rider, or to do something really simple like ask the horse to slow down or to turn. When pressure is taken and the horse feels that pressure, then it, because of it, the response they've linked in the past to the bit pressure, which is some usually some degree of tension and discomfort, which even can come from never really being trained how to respond to a bit. So it's almost a stemming from that first unknown response. So I'm not saying that that when we have horses that have these kind of things, that it's from any kind of even abuse or um, poor training. It can even just be a lack of training. So what we need to do is help the horse understand that when they feel that pressure, that's actually an invitation to relax. Because a horse that is really relaxed and soft in their body isn't going to be tossing their head. So whenever we think about changing a behavior, we need to give the horse something else to do. We have to, instead of just trying to say, hey, stop this thing, what is that we want them to do instead? So in the case of head tossing, what we'd like for them to do is when they feel any kind of bit tension, um, rain pressure, that they soften, that they relax their neck, that they reach forward with their head. That's the kind of movement that we want from a ridden horse. 
So that's really what we're looking for. So how I like to start with this is um, starting from just the ground, taking a little bit of pressure, um, wading through all those different head movements, and then waiting until the horse softens and releasing with that. So there's a uh, kind of a whole series of training that you can do, but it's and lots of different exercises that can help with this, but it all comes back to this principle of wanting to change the horse's response to that bit pressure. So I hope this is helpful, Deborah. All right, we've got one in the comments here. Hello, Equestrian Sophie. Do you have any tips for keeping the canter to pointing or figure eights? Also, what are things you look for before letting a student jump? Great question. So for keeping the canter, are you um, referring to yourself as the rider being able to maintain the canter or to the horse? I'm going to assume that it's the horse uh, maintaining the gait. So usually if a horse is breaking gait, they're losing balance or they're losing energy. So if they're losing balance, it might be they enter a turn and they're, they struggle to balance or the rider becomes unbalanced and causes that. And therefore, the horse then breaks to a trot, slows down to get their balance. It can also come from the horse just not having enough energy. So I first do a lot of transitions even within the next lower gate. So for example, in trot, can you do a faster trot, slower trot, faster trot, slower trot? And then go into canter, have a really nice forward canter for four or five strides and come back to trot and practice that way. And you can do the same thing with your, um, with your figure eights. So riding your figure eights, ride them at the gait that is comfortable, that you can maintain it. So you're working on the pattern itself before you start to then go up through the gait. So it's better to have a smooth figure eight ridden at walk, for example. And then when you start to trot it, maybe you just trot to that part of it where you're going across the diagonal, you know, into the other loop. Instead of trying to trot all the way around and having the horse break three or four times where you're kind of constantly struggling to keep them going. So lots of transitions, um, but looking for power moving forward and working at the lower gait um, in the patterns to get your smoothness. Um, things I look for before letting a student jump is that they are comfortable following the movement of the horse. Um, I would, I always work with students in having them go over trot poles, um, and raising the height of those trot poles. So like raising alternate ends, um, doing, just doing lots of things where I see that they're following the movement of the horse. And when I work on two point, two point is um, learning to change where the weight is going. So instead of standing up out of the stirrups, learning to um, move the body forward at the hip joints, move the body back at the hip joints so that there's this, this concept of being um, mobile at the hips and being able to keep the center the rider's center of balance or center of mass over their feet. So that's really the key to jumping instead of standing on the stirrups. Um, and we have an excellent program uh, that was developed here at horse class by um, one of the our teachers, Wendy Murdoch, the Effortless Jumping Course. And Wendy is soon going to be offering this course with with personal instruction as well on her own platform. And the, the effortless jumping course is a great next step. So right now I'm teaching my balanced riding course, which is like a 101 program for mostly it's, it, I developed this program when I had many students that were coming and they were working with me in person and I wanted them to have something in between their lessons. So I really developed the balanced riding course for riders who were new to riding, were returning to riding and wanted more than they were getting out of weekly lessons, wanted to understand more of the horsemanship side of the horse behavior. And that's how the balanced riding course started over 13 years ago now. Um, over 11 years ago now. And we have thousands of students from so many different countries. It's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing community and it's open right now. But the balance riding course is 
the 101 program that we have at horse class. And then many of our other instructors take what I'm teaching in the balanced riding course and they teach it at a much um, higher or focused level in our other programs, such as the jumping program. All right, I'm going to go back to our early questions. For those of you watching, remember that you can put in your questions here and I will be happy to answer those. So we had another question that came from um, Vivian and uh, Vivian had two. One was about tack cleaning um, and maintaining tack. So Vivian lives in South Florida, very hot and humid most of the year and is wondering for tips and best practices for ongoing maintenance of tack. So this is one of those that can depend a lot on where you live. I would love for everyone that's on to just put in where you live and what you do for your leather tack. I have found that in hot and humid um, places, keeping the tack somewhere where it can stay as dry as possible. So the dry is even, I would say, more important than the cool uh, because when it's constantly humid, that's when the mold likes to grow. So if you can if you can keep the tack as dry as possible, um, give it a wipe down with a leather cleaner, not glycerin soap, but a leather cleaner each time that you finish it, and then give it a good oiling usually about once a week. So oiling it too much, it gets like a greasy residue on it. Cleaning all the time with glycerin soap gives it a greasy residue, um, but a good wipe down each after each ride, especially if you're in a hot climate, assuming your horse is sweating a lot, this can really make a big difference for keeping that healthy. All right. Vivian also asked another question that was really good. What does your typical week with horses look like and how do you balance just hanging out versus intentional groundwork versus riding? So I uh, this is such a good question. And for me, it varies. But I would say I spend, I always like to spend some time when I first go out to the horses, just hanging out with them. It helps to put me in a better state of mind, a better place for riding. If I spend a little time when I go out to the field and I'm just there and I'm just relaxing with the horses. And it doesn't even mean that I'm interacting directly with them, but I will um, I will walk around the field. I'll look at the grasses that they're eating. I will, um, I will look around. I will notice the things that they're looking at. And I find that this just helps me to potentially slow down a little bit. It um, gives the opportunity for the horses to come up to me instead of always me just marching out with a halter and putting the halter on. And then I, you know, after some time there and how much time I spend in that, um, in that kind of state with them, it, it depends on my day and it depends on how much time I have. But I do, I do some of that each time that I go out. And then I might go on to my training. But I find those little times even within my training block. Right now, I'm doing most of my training outside of an arena on um, roads and trails. And I might be working on a stretch of road, working back and forth, doing some shoulder ins, doing some leg yields, um, doing that kind of work with my, my horse now. And then I'll just hop off and I'll let him graze a little bit by the end um, or by the side of the road. And I'll kind of do the same thing where I just, I, I just uh, enjoy being out there in nature. I let him graze. It's a clear mental break. And then we come back and we go back to work. I think it's so fascinating how our our relationships with our horses are different. And I've said this before in other videos, our relationships with horses are different because we want this really close connection with them. And we can definitely develop a, a relationship with them, but we have to remember that we shouldn't be the most important thing in their life because we're only spending maybe at most an hour, maybe two hours a day with them. And they need those other horse relationships to fill their social needs for the rest of their lives. It's a very different kind of relationship than maybe a companion dog that is literally spending, you know, 23, 24 hours a day by our side. We had another question come in. Let me just find this one. Um, this one was also really good. It came in via email. Um, and this one was, I believe, from Linda. And she was talking about 
Um, I'm going to paraphrase her question a bit here, but she's got a gelding who is the low horse on the totem pole in a five horse pasture on 30 acres. So lots of space, few horses out there, but he's the lowest one on the totem pole. Um, and she's only right now seeing the horses two times a week. There's some herd dynamics going on that there's one horse that it sounds like is more of the um, kind of bossy dominant horse out in the field. And right now she's just got a half an hour with them, sometimes even less. So what to do to make that time as beneficial as possible? And I'm assuming that you mean especially for your horse that you're focusing on. So here's what I would do. I think so many times when we have a short amount of time, we we want to do something because it helps us feel more productive if we're doing something. Okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this or that exercise. But I would make your doing going out and for at least the first week or two, just notice how can you do something that matters to your horse. If he wants scratched, it's scratching him. If he wants to stand, if he's standing there and sleeping, then, you know, stand next to him, not close enough that it disturbs him or makes him at all uncomfortable, but stand there and look around, you know, be the sentry for him. Um, if he is grazing, then notice what grasses is he, what grasses is he actually grazing? And are there things that maybe he likes to browse, like certain leaves that you could reach up higher in the tree and grab those for him? Just looking for all the different ways to give more value to your horse is one of the strongest ways to create relationship. And this is something that I have done a much better job of doing since um, the last few years of connecting with and working with Andrea Wadey, who is the instructor of Pure Liberty at Horse Class and also the leader of our Wise Riders program, I it's one of the things that Andrea teaches is to, to first create friendship with the horse. And friendship is built by doing something that matters to the other. So that would be how I would start. And then from there, just make little asks. Can you ask him to move his body? Can you ask him to come towards you, to come away from you? But you can then start to use the, the things that you learned that he really likes, his favorite scratch spots, his favorite pieces of grass or things to browse. You can then use those things to reward the behaviors that you're wanting reward the times that go really well in the more formal exercises that you do together. All right. I think we've got time for one more question here. I'm going to keep this to about 20 minutes. So put your questions in the comments, anyone who's watching along, and I am going to pull up one more here from our early questions that came in. Oh, I love this one. This one came in from Aletha. And she said, is being highly sensitive incompatible with riding and horsemanship? And if not, why not? I often read about the importance of paying attention to the personalities of different horses, but no one talks about the importance of acknowledging different people. Some of us relate to horses because we are just as sensitive. Our horses may feel too much. Our brains may process too deeply. This is beautifully written, Aletha. And I believe that being highly sensitive is not incompatible at all with riding and horsemanship. In fact, I believe that being highly sensitive can be a enormous advantage to working with horses. And I'll explain why. I believe why being in riding can be a challenging for people that are highly sensitive and have um, more acute sensory systems is because there's there's so much that unfortunately is still taught in the horsemanship world, especially about shutting that down. You know, you push through your fear, you show the horse who's boss, you got to have this hard edge. Um, 
It still brings in the elements of riding and horsemanship that come from its background in the military, um, that come from its its background and still its present day roots in um, competitive sport. And in those in those literal arenas, there's more of those sorts of pressure that if you're too highly sensitive, it's seen as as a fault because you kind of kind of just got to pull your boots up and get through it is is the type of um, of mindset that's often taught where I believe being highly sensitive is a huge gift and advantage is because it does allow you to connect more deeply with the horse. It allows you to to potentially experience the world more closely to what the horse does by, well, I'm going to give a specific example and, um, and anyone can read this. This is from the work of, um, the, she's a, she's an autistic professor and is a professor at, um, at Colorado State. Her name is going to come to me in just a moment. And because of her sensory processing systems from being on the autism spectrum, she's made huge contributions to research on equine behavior and on animal handling animal behavior in general, because she's able to see things that the animals are seeing or noticing that many people are not. For example, there was one example um, in one of her books, and her favorite book is called, or my favorite book of hers is called Animals in Translation. And it is... She gives the example of there were cattle moving through a certain area and the cattle were balking and the men were starting to come out with the the shock prods and trying to push them through. And what she saw was there was just a little piece of plastic wrapper that was hanging on the fence. And this plastic wrapper was blowing in the wind and it was catching the eye of all these cattle coming through and it was spooking them and they didn't want to go past None of the other people were noticing this, but because of the way that her sensory processing system worked, she saw that and she was able to notice it, remove it, and then all of the pressure wasn't needed to push the cattle through. Selena Temple Grandin, thank you so much. My my brain was still working trying to come up, bring that name to the front. I I love this example and I think it perfectly perfectly illustrates where being highly sensitive can really be a gift with animals because it allows you more insight. It allows you to be a better observer in many cases, and it allows you to be empathetic and have more of a feeling of putting yourself in the other's the other shoes, the other's paws, um, which can then allow for more even just creativity in training situations. So definitely embrace the positive aspects of of your sensitivity. So thank you. Let me just see. Ah, we've got Selena. Is it bad to cuddle a horse too much? It, It totally depends on the situation. It's when people ask, you know, well, can I pet him here? Can I pet him there? How much is too much? It's not something that can be answered in a general format. It it all depends on the situation. Does the horse enjoy it, for one? Some horses will, some horses won't. And if you're cuddling a horse that's not truly enjoying it, it can actually be um, more of a block between the two, you know, between you and the horse, than be something that is um, improving the relationship between the two of you. So does the horse enjoy it? Um, and also... Are you, if you've been told that you've cuddled too much, something that you might want to ask yourself is, can you also make requests of the horse? So can you, um, you know, spend lots of time grooming, cuddling, 
But if you need to, can you also make a request? Can you can you ask them to do something and have them respond? Because that is an equally important part of um, for our horses. Just domestic life, working around people, is they you know they need to be able to understand and respond to um, to requests from us. And the more that they can do that, the more that their life is um, lower stress as well. So thank you so much for everyone that has joined me here. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll be doing more of these pop-up lives in the future. If you are interested in the Balanced Riding course, this round is open through Monday, March 25th. And you can get all the information at horseclass.com slash BRC. The Balanced Riding course is a combination of riding skills and also horse training and horse behavior. So it's really a holistic view of riding and horsemanship, bringing together the different pieces that can help us become better riders. And this year for the first time, it's the course itself is lifetime access, but I'll also be supporting you for a full year with video coaching and with um, helping you know exactly what to focus on for you through the coaching support each month. So again, thank you for joining me here. I'll see you soon.